is a real pleasure for me to introduce Christopher Nimick from the University of Rochester. Professor Nimick is a social and personality psychologist from that university. As a psychologist, he's very much interested in human motivation. So he uses self-determination theory in trying to understand the functional nature of motivation in different domains of life, such as education, work, sports, and work environment. Despite his young age, Christopher has made great academic achievements. He is a very well recognized senior lecturer and researcher. He has published extensively in different index journals. According to Google Scholar, his work has been cited for more than 2,700 times and with a very high impact index. As a lecturer, Christopher has traveled to many countries presenting his research results and con giving consultancy to young and old researchers. Today, he's here with us to talk about the theory that he loves, self-determination theory, a theory that believes in the human capacity to recover that intrinsic motivation with which we are all born. So let us please welcome Christopher Nimick. Um, of the climate, of course, but the warmth of the people as well. It's a real, um, <coughs> it's a real pleasure to be exposed to so many people who care and, and have genuine concern for others. I was also struck by what I found to be a real greed for knowledge. You know, when I teach at the University of Rochester, it's typically the case that people come into class and they leave right on the button after an hour and 15 minutes. But just last night, and this was no, no anomaly for my being here, I had a two-hour workshop that lasted three hours and a half. And it's amazing to me. From 5.30 until 9 o'clock, people are staying, they're engaged, they're asking questions. I've only found that in Columbia, and it's a real beautiful thing um, to see and to be a part of. So thank you again for being here. Um, as Anna said, I'm, I'm a psychologist. And as most of you may know, psychology is a huge discipline within um, the social sciences. More specifically, I'm trained as a social personality psychologist, which means that when I take a look at a particular phenomenon of interest, I take a look at that phenomenon of interest from two perspectives. As a social psychologist, I acknowledge that we are deeply connected individuals. We don't exist in a vacuum. We go out into the world and we try to forge connections with others. And undoubtedly, the world around us, the social contexts in which we live, have an impact on our thoughts, our feelings, our motivations, and our behaviors. At the same time, individual differences exist and individual differences matter. You know, some of us are highly neurotic, others of us are highly emotionally stable. Some of us are highly extroverted. Some of us, like myself, are deeply introverted. Our mental energies are channeled inward, you know, getting up and talking in front of people. Not really what I would choose if I had a choice. Of course I would, but, you know, it's not really, I don't go into parties and sort of become the life of the party. I'm much more likely to exist over there if I had <laughs> a real choice. But nonetheless, individual differences exist and individual differences matter, and they affect our thoughts, our feelings, our motivations, and our behaviors. As some of you may know, social personality psychology is a huge and vibrant field within psychology. There are many different areas of study. In particular, the area of study within social personality psychology that I take interest in is human motivation. For me, all that matters in the world, all that matters in life, is human motivation. Look around your own life and ask yourself, does motivation matter? Some of you may be parents, some of you may be in relationships, some of you may be employees, students, teachers, so on and so forth. Undoubtedly, motivation matters in each one of those particular areas of your life. These days, interest in human motivation is booming. It's a very large and very vibrant field of study. 
And the particular area of study within motivation that I have a deep affinity for is called self-determination theory. And so what I would like to do today is to con consider self-determination theory as an approach to enhancing students' motivation and wellness. Now, I've um, constructed our time together in the following way. First, whenever I travel and indeed whenever I teach, I take great interest in the thoughts, the opinions, and the perspectives of those with whom I'm speaking. So I'd like to spend the first little part of our time together to consider your perspectives on motivation in the classroom. After we consider your perspectives on motivation in the classroom, I'd like to introduce an overview of self-determination theory. At a fairly general, abstract level, what are the basic principles, the basic tenets of self-determination theory? If we can agree that motivation matters, and if we can agree that the central core of self-determination theory matters, then I'd like to consider an application of self-determination theory to education practice. At the core of self-determination theory is the idea that all people have three basic psychological needs. These are the needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And so if we can see the relevance of self-determination theory in education practice, then I'd like to wrap up our time together, together considering how we can create need-supportive education climates. To that end, I'd like to consider some work that I've been doing with Anna and with others around the world on students' perceptions of motivating and demotivating teachers. And then finally, I'd like to consider how we can put all of this work into practice. How can we as educators work to support the basic psychological needs of our students in order, in order to facilitate healthy, autonomous, self-determined experiences. So I'd first like to consider um, a preamble. First, motivation is all around us. It's in our lay language, it's in our naive psychology. And motivation gets defined in many unique idiosyncratic ways. My question for you is, how do you define motivation? What does motivation mean to you? What does it mean to be motivated? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll repeat. I'll repeat. I'm sorry. Oh, fine. OK. So it's like having the enough energy to do something. OK. So one way in which we define motivation is that it's about energy. You know, when we feel motivated, there's something inside of us. There's something that's burning. There's something that's activated. There's something that's energized. What else? Uh, uh, I would say my personal opinion, um, it's like the connection with happiness. It's like uh, connects me with the uh, feeling, the sensation of something wellness, something good, something yeah. pleasant to me. Yeah, yeah. So there's another way of defining motivation, which is that there's a real interconnection between motivation and happiness, or wellness more broadly. It's easy for us to think about a state of a motivation. You know, when people are apathetic, listless, depressed, typically happiness and wellness are not a part of those experiences. Whereas when we feel motivated, when we have energy and activation, we tend to feel happy and experience a state of well-being. Well, for me, motivation is like a passion for th something. OK. And so another way of defining motivation is passion. And really, the, the, the key point that, that she made was passion for something. What it means to be motivated is not only to have energy, which is a part of the definition of motivation, but also to have direction, to have goals, to have values, to have aspirations to which we orient and direct our behaviors. Those best times in our life when we're motivated in a really healthy way involve a state of energy and a state of direction toward valued goals. And so I just solicited three perspectives, and across the three, we came up with a really beautiful, simple definition of motivation. Motivation is the energization and direction of behavior, and when it's done well, it leads to wellness. Good. Now, I don't really know my audience, and I apologize for that, but I'm going to assume that you are all, all, you're all teachers? 
Is that true? Good. Okay. And you've all been students at some point in your life? Mm -hmm. Fine. Fine. So I'd like to consider now your perspectives on motivation in the classroom. And I want to first consider the perspective of student. This may be going back many, many months, many, many years, many, many decades. <laughs> but in any event, place yourself in the mind of a student. You know, we have different experiences about what motivates us in the classroom. My question for you is, what types of experiences motivate you as students in the classroom? Yeah. When I have challenge. OK. So one, this is going to occur very quickly. One, one uh, experience that motivates us in the classroom is challenge. The idea is we don't like to have things that are too easy. We don't like to be bored in the classroom. We also don't like to have experiences that are too much, too difficult. We don't want to be anxious in the classroom. So challenge, particularly when that challenge is optimal, we're really motivated. What else? Thank you. Um, for me, motivation also is also about engagement, and therefore I'm motivated when I'm engaged in some sort of activity for me to learn or to talk or whatever. I'm going to come right back to you, so hold on onto the mic. Motivation is also about engagement. You know, when we're really engaged in our work, we feel motivated. My question for you, and I guess for anyone else, is what do you find engaging? What about a classroom is particularly engaging for you? Um, yeah. Well, may I say, if, if, if uh, the question is, is directed to the person that is in front of us, like, uh, in the leading role, I would say that that person is convinced of what he or she is doing. It's like, uh, the teacher oh, or the student? Yes, the teacher is convinced, okay. is totally convinced of what she's doing okay. or he's doing. Okay. I think that motivates me. And so one way in which we're engaged is when we can see very clearly, implicitly and explicitly, that the teacher is convinced about what she or he is doing. Mm -hmm. The teacher has bought into what she or he is teaching. There's a sense of passion, there's a sense of vitality that spews forth from the teacher. about being involved in the learning process. So yes. not only sitting there, hearing, yes. and just accept things because somebody's telling me, but also like having the chance to give my opinion and yes. to give a different perspective yes. of the issue. So I yes. am involved yes. uh, in all the process yes. of the It's not enough to have a passionate teacher. It's not enough to have challenge. We want to have a voice. We want to be personally invested in what we're doing. And when we can feel personally invested, when we can see how the material relates to our life, that's when we really have a high level of engagement and a high level of motivation. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, I, uh, when I was a student, I studied engineering, and now I'm teaching engineering. And in this field, for me, it was very motivating to see real life applications of what we are learning. Yeah, yeah. Can you take the material that's being taught to me, teacher, and tell me why it matters? Or better yet, show me how it matters. Take the formula that are in the textbook and translate them into real life. A final point on this is, you know, no one learns by him or herself. Most classrooms have more than one student in them. Do social dynamics matter in the classroom? And how do they matter for those who are shaking their head? OK, that you are making connections with other people, yeah. and you can share your feelings and your yeah. knowledge with them. Yeah. The idea is that what's really motivating in the classroom is when we can make connections with others, when we can develop relationships. And I want to take a look around the room now and see what's been voiced. You guys probably have very little, if any, exposure to self-determination theory. I know you have some, but on average, probably very little. And I want you to know that these pictures over here were not put up haphazardly or incidentally. 
Look at the content of these pictures when asked the question, what types of experiences motivate you in the classroom? One of the thoughts was, of course I can't <laughs> put this on the slide. One of the thoughts was, what's really motivating is that when the material relates to my life, when I can see how the material relates to my life and I can make sense of it, I can have a sense of personal involvement, personal connection with the material. That's autonomy. Also challenge. When I can feel like I'm growing, when I can feel like I'm succeeding through what I'm learning, I feel motivated. That's competence. And then finally, connections. I mean, we don't really want to see these connections between teachers and students. We hope we don't see those, but sometimes we do, of course. But we want to form close relationships with important others. Meaningful connections where it's clear that the students care for one another, the teachers care for the students, and vice versa. That's relatedness. And so on your own, of your own accord, quite naturally, you guys have all said that what motivates you in the classroom are experiences that are conducive to autonomy, to competence, that's rela and relatedness. That's remarkable. Now, I'd like you guys to flip uh, your perspective. As teachers, we have different ways of motivating our students. You know, We have different goals in terms of how we would like our classrooms to look and how we would like our classrooms to operate. Some of us really prefer to have compliance in the classroom. You know, this is not really me speaking, but I'm a teacher who would love when the principal walks by and she looks in the classroom, everyone is sitting really straight in his or her chair, backs right against the chair, wearing ties, and if they're sort of doing this, like, you know, thank you, that's even better. I don't really care if they're engaged. I don't really care if they're learning. I just don't want people bouncing around off the walls. I don't want them talking outside of their turn. Fine. Other teachers say, you know what? I can't win them all. I will have some students who are engaged, and I will have some students who are not engaged. My job as a teacher is to speak to those students who are willing to listen. If I can have a couple of students who are engaged, I'm doing my job well. And still other teachers say no. My job is actually to maximize engagement for all the students. It's not enough to have half the class engaged and half the class apathetic. I want, and it's my responsibility to have, all of the class meaningfully engaged in the lesson and learning at a deep level. Now, there are different ways in which we motivate our students in the classroom. Some of us say, you know what, I can bring out my long finger and point it at you and say, you better get your act together or else. I'm going to fail you, you're going to kick you, I'm going to kick you out of the university, so on and so forth. Others may say, you know, I'm bigger than you, I'm older than you, I have more degrees than you, you better get your act together and do what I say. You know, I can raise my voice in the classroom. Does that work? Maybe, but not usually for good outcomes. And then finally, other teachers say, you know, my job is really to work in collaboration with my students. I want to facilitate the process of learning. And the best way to do it is to get down on the level of the students and to understand from their perspective, how do you see this material? How do you make sense of it? How do you relate it to your life? What do you find interesting? What do you find challenging? What do you not like about it? And let's have a conversation that proceeds accordingly. So we have different goals in terms of engagement, and we have different ways of motivating our students. My question for you is, how do you motivate your students in the classroom? Well, I'm trying to use different strategies. Once at the beginning, I'm teaching at postgraduate level, and it's usually 
Tuesday, Friday, 5 to 9 p.m. So mm -hmm. people is tired. So usually I engage them at the beginning doing some exercise, like yoga or yeah. stretching or something like that. And they start love. Yeah. And they make them happy. Uh -huh. And then uh, I try to, to ask them about the topic we are uh, doing during the class and then what that topic means to their everyday life. Mm -hmm. So they can be like involved in the topic. So it's easy because I'm not the one who is talking, right. but the one who is leading a conversation right. between them. Right. So this is right. like a, one of the strategies. The idea is to use a variety of strategies that really appeal to the needs of the students. You know, the class occurs late at night, and so let's get the students up and moving for a little bit to sort of harness a little more energy toward the end of the night. And then use some strategies that involve appealing to students' interests, appealing to students' um, own perspectives, and trying to tailor lessons and course material to the needs and the interests of the students. Other approaches, how you motivate your students. Sometimes I try to play with them, and it works sometimes, mm -hmm. we, but it doesn't work sometimes. It's difficult, for example, uh, I try to put a lot of examples in my classes, but sometimes uh, the students are like, a, what is she saying? Uh, it's difficult to try to put this, uh, the, the theory uh, in the example, right. and he's try to. It's it's difficult to do this connection. Mm -hmm. So, for me, all depends uh, on the student. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so another so approach is you know, students differ. Yeah. And how they learn differs. So, and you plan the course, and you plan your methodology. Uh, without taking account who is in front of you. So it's difficult to match what you have prepared before and, yeah. and what is happening in real life. Yeah. So sometimes it works, but sometimes not. And this is my point, how you manage this situation mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. it, wor it doesn't mm -hmm. work. Yeah. So, so the general theme is that there's a disconnect between the lesson plan that you have and the learning that may or may not be occurring in the classroom. And so the question becomes, how do I tailor my pedagogy to fit the needs, the changing needs, and the emerging exactly. needs exactly. of the classroom? I think that that requires a lot of flexibility. And what we're going to talk about are ways in which teachers can be need supportive. And really, need supportive teaching involves Flexibility. Oh, and we need the strategies because, yeah. for example, of all time the students are with the mobile phones, and you are uh, you are not motivated uh, to teach to somebody who is not listening to you. Yeah. So I don't know how to 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 encourage uh, mm -hmm. them to listen to you. Just this little detail. How made that they listen to you. Sometimes it's really difficult. I think yeah. that with this generation is difficult uh, communicate mm -hmm. an idea in all kind of levels, not just in class, uh, as well, as well uh, in other spaces. When you are talking with them in a dinner or something like that, you are seeing so in that they are with these uh, mobile phones and you are how you communicate mm -hmm. with them well we'll continue to talk about strategies for for disengaged and motivated uh, students keeping your own motivational experiences in mind i'd like to introduce you guys now to five hypothetical students who characterize a variety of reasons why we do what we do in the classroom Students complete their studies for a variety of reasons. Andy, for example, studies to earn a good grade or to avoid being ridiculed by his classmates 
as incompetent. Now think back over all of your educational experiences. How many of you, by a show of hands, have ever had an experience similar to Andy's in the classroom? A lot of people over here, no one over here? So about 50% of the students, fine. Our second hypothetical student, Barb, studies to feel pride for being a good student or to avoid feeling guilty for not having studied hard enough. Whereas with Andy, he was studying to earn the grade or to avoid the ridicule, which existed in the environment. For Barb, her reinforcement is inside. She has her own internal rigid standards. And when Barb lives up to those rigid standards, she praises herself for being a good, a good student. And when she fails to live up to those rigid standards, she punishes herself. She feels guilty, she feels ashamed. How many of you have ever had experiences such as Barb in the classroom? Again, about half, fine. Chris, our third student, studies because he finds his classwork to be valuable and important. There's personal meaning, there's personal relevance for Chris. How many of you have ever had an experience similar to Chris in the classroom? 60, 65%, fine. Dom studies because he wants to earn a degree and to help people in need, which aligns with his, his other life values. For Dom, he has a set of life goals. He has a set of overarching principles, who he wants to be and how he wants to be. And for Dom, what he does in the classroom is aligned with his overarching life goals and aspirations. How many of you have ever had an experience similar to Dom's in the classroom? Some, yeah, fine. And then finally, Ed studies because he finds his classwork to be inherently satisfying and enjoyable. For Ed, it's fun. There's something about learning that's fun. How many of you have ever had an experience similar to Ed? Right, again, about 75%. Okay, so, it's interesting. There are a variety of reasons why we do what we do in the classroom. There are different types of motivation that students can have in the classroom. Of course, from a psychological perspective, this leads us to a very important question. Who do you think will perform best academically? Now, on the previous slide, I let you put your hands up as many times as you wanted. With this slide, I'm going to ask you to put your hand up only once. Who do you think will perform best academically? Andy? No one. Barb? One. Chris? No one? One, fine. Dom? A handful. Ed? There go all the rest of the hands. It's very interesting. Although there are a variety of reasons why we do what we do in the classroom, it seems that some reasons are more conducive than others to high quality performance in the classroom. It's the Chris's, it's the Dom's, it's the Ed's of the educational world that seem to be more likely to achieve high quality performance in their academic pursuits. But of course, as educators, as quality educators, we care not only about our students' performance, we also care about our students' well-being. And so this leads us to another important question. Who do you think will be happiest while at school? Andy? Barb? One. Chris? Dom? One. Two. Ed? There go the rest of the hands. And so again, it's very interesting. Although there are various reasons why we do what we do in the classroom, it seems that more, some reasons are more conducive than others to well-being in the classroom. And those same motivations that are conducive to high-quality performance seem also to be conducive to wellness and happiness in the classroom. And so with that in mind, it's important to consider relevant theory and research that focuses on different types of motivation in the classroom and to consider evidence for whether and how teachers can facilitate optimal motivation at school. 
And with that in mind, I'd like to present now an overview of self-determination theory. Motivation has been a long-standing topic of theoretical and empirical inquiry within psychology almost since the inception of psychology itself. Psychology is about 140 years old as a field, and over the decades, interest in human motivation has waxed and waned over time. There have been some periods in our history where there's been a very strong focus on human motivation, and there's been other periods in our history where there's been a very weak or a very low level of interest in human motivation. These days, interest in human motivation is booming. Motivation is a very important, very strong, uh, strongly researched subdiscipline within psychology. And indeed, applications of human motivation cut across psychological subdisciplines and domains of life. Think about all of those important areas of your life and ask yourself, does motivation matter? Motivation matters in parenting. Motivation matters in our relationships. Motivation matters in our work life. Motivation matters for our health. Motivation matters in sport. And to be sure, motivation matters in education practice. Now, historically, there have been two predominant views on human motivation. The so-called traditional view argues that motivation is a unitary concept. That is to say, motivation is a concept that differs in amount rather than type. Some people have a high level of motivation and others have a low level. And the idea is, the more motivation a person has, the better off that person will be psychologically and behaviorally. Of course, the implicit assumption with the traditional view is, it doesn't matter how we get that person motivated, so long as we get that person motivated. We can dangle carrots in front of him and get him motivated. We can hit him on the backside with sticks and get him motivated. We can appeal to his interests and get him motivated. It doesn't matter how, so long as his motivation is high. In contrast, the differentiated view considers that there are different types, distinct types of motivation that function in very different ways. And self-determination theory views motivation from a differentiated perspective. One type of motivation is called intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation can be defined as doing an activity because it is inherently satisfying and enjoyable. With intrinsic motivation, there are no separable outcomes or contingencies that reinforce the behavior. Rather, the behavior is inherently satisfying and the behavior occurs spontaneously and oftentimes manifests as exploration and play. To see intrinsic motivation, look at what children do. I mean, have any of you guys ever been around children at two, three, four years before the world has polluted them with our own agendas for them? What do children do in those very precious early years of their life? They discover, they play, they, they're curious, they explore, they manipulate. They manipulate everything in their world in order to understand how the world works. Children don't require rewards. They don't require threats of punishment to play. Rather, they do so because it's enjoyable and they do so because it's fun. It's intrinsically motivated. Now think about those times in your life when you experience intrinsic motivation. Think about those times when you're pursuing your hobbies, when you're being playful. How does it feel? Great. How else does it feel? Happy. Happiness? Satisfaction? I imagine that you have experiences such as interest, excitement, and enjoyment. Intrinsic motivation feels good because intrinsic motivation is good for us. And indeed, intrinsic motivation is the prototype of autonomous, self-determined behavior. Now, 
intrinsic motivation is a beautiful experience. And intrinsic motivation is a very delicate experience. Intrinsic motivation is easily impacted by social conditions in the world around us. And research within self-determination theory over the last 45 years has carefully examined what factors in the environment affect intrinsic motivation. And what the research has shown is, unequivocally, contingent rewards undermine intrinsic motivation. If you take someone who enjoys doing something and you pay them for doing it, over time they will lose their inherent satisfaction for the activity. You know? Let's say that you like soccer. You know, you would play soccer simply because. You don't need anyone to tell you play soccer. And in fact, when people tell you to play soccer, the experience feels worse than if you just did it naturally. Fine. And you're an eight-year-old girl. Not like that you are, but imagine that you are. And your father comes along and he says, what's your name? Maria. Maria. Okay. Maria, I have an idea. I know you love soccer, but I think I can get you to really enjoy playing soccer. Every time you score a goal, now this is going back to whatever, 1990 or 1995, I don't know how old you are, but every time you score a goal, I'm going to give you 40,000 Colombian pesos. Wow. I mean, I loved playing soccer to begin with, but now I'm going to get paid for playing soccer? What can be better? And so Maria goes about her time, and she kicks the ball in the net, and she gets a 40,000 Colombian peso reward. Great! And she does it again, and she scores, and she gets paid again. Fantastic. But what happens in that experience? Over time, she starts to see her behavior not as, I'm doing this because it's fun, but I'm doing this because it leads to a reward. I'm doing this to get paid. And so her focus shifts. She starts to feel much less choiceful and much more like a pawn to her father's money. God forbid you don't score a goal. Oh, what a waste of an hour and a half that was. I could have gone to work and made some real money. Or your father, his pockets run dry. <laughs> What's the point of playing anymore? I can't get paid. Contingent rewards undermine intrinsic motivation. And in many classrooms, grades are nothing more than contingent rewards. Threats of punishment undermine intrinsic motivation. Does anyone really enjoy their experience when someone is openly threatening them? You better take good notes or else you won't have dinner tonight? No, of course not. Deadlines. Raise your hand if you like deadlines. <laughs> Not even you who thought that Barb was going to be the best ever? Deadlines undermine intrinsic motivation. Surveillance. I'm going to keep on talking, and I want you just to keep on taking your notes, and I'm just going to closely monitor what you're doing. No, I'm serious. I'm going to closely <laughs> monitor what you're doing. Wait a minute. I need, to, I need to actually see what you've done so far. So let's see. Self-determination theory, that's good. Uh, relatedness, that's good. Motivation, you're doing good. Keep up the good work. Okay. Does anyone really enjoy their experience when someone else has their nose poking around their business? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. <laughs> Surveillance undermines intrinsic motivation. And finally, evaluations. Even when the evaluations are unequivocally positive, the very fact of being told, go and make a piece of art, and then give it to me and I'll evaluate you on your artistic ability, leaves you feeling more pressured and less free in what you're doing. So again, rewards, threats, deadlines, surveillance, evaluations, all undermine intrinsic motivation. In contrast, choice, meaningful choice, enhances intrinsic motivation. And from a self-determination theory perspective, this leads to a very important question. Why? Why do rewards, threats of punishment, deadlines, surveillance, evaluations, all undermine the sense of choicefulness that we have with intrinsic motivation? And choice enhances 
intrinsic motivation? And the answer is all people regardless of gender, age, culture, social class, all people have a basic psychological need for autonomy. We all need to feel volitional. We all need to feel self-determined. We all need to feel as though we reflectively endorse our behavior. When autonomy is experienced, intrinsic motivation is more likely to be experienced. Now, Self-determination theory has its critics, and one of the loudest critics comes with regard to whether autonomy is a universal need. We make very strong statements that all people need autonomy. And there's a group of researchers who are called cultural relativists, and what the cultural relativists say is, Easterners, you know, East Asians, they don't need autonomy. They're much too collectivistic to need autonomy. Women, they don't need autonomy. They're much too interdependent to need autonomy. The working class, they don't need autonomy. They too are much too interdependent to need autonomy. You're a woman, I ask you, do you like to feel subjugated? Do you like to feel pressured and pushed around in life? No. All people, regardless of gender, age, culture, social class, have a basic psychological need for autonomy. Other research has shown that negative feedback undermines intrinsic motivation, whereas positive feedback enhances intrinsic motivation. Again, why? And the answer is, in addition to a need for autonomy, all people have a basic psychological need for competence. We all need to feel capable we all need to feel effective. We all need to feel masterful in what we are doing. When we feel autonomous, when we feel competent, our intrinsic motivation flourishes. Now, intrinsic motivation tends to decline with age. And a second type of motivation is called extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation refers to doing an activity because it leads to a separable outcome or consequence such as obtaining a reward or avoiding a punishment. Extrinsic motivation characterizes those behaviors that we do that are not inherently satisfying and enjoyable. And indeed, a large majority of the behaviors that we do as adults are extrinsically motivated. You know, as parents, I have two daughters. We don't change our children's dirty diapers because it's so fun and enjoyable and I can't wait to take another wipe. Absolutely not. We do so because doing so helps protect the health and the well-being of our children. And so this leads us to an important question. Can extrinsic motivation be internalized? Can it be internalized such that we come to a place of doing the extrinsically motivated behavior willingly, with a sense of autonomy, with a sense of volition. Within self-determination theory, internalization is the active, natural process of coming to endorse the value of an extrinsically motivated behavior. Internalization is necessary for the self-initiation and the maintenance of behaviors that are not intrinsically motivated. And what we see is that people tend to internalize aspects of the environment that are endorsed by important others. Think about those values that you hold. Think about those beliefs that you have. And I'm willing to bet that with some reflection, you'll realize that a large part of who you are is a function of those in the world to whom you feel close. It's likely that you internalize your parents' values, your friends' values, your lovers' values, to the extent that you feel close to them. Why? Because in addition to autonomy and competence, all people have a third basic psychological need for relatedness. We all need to feel cared for by others. We all need to feel connected with others. We all need to feel concerned for and with others. And together, when we experience autonomy, competence, and relatedness, we tend to feel not only intrinsic motivation, 
but we tend also to internalize extrinsically motivated behaviors. Within self-determination theory, there exists a continuum of internalization. There are different types of extrinsic motivation. The least internalized, the least autonomous type of extrinsic motivation is called external regulation. With external regulation, we behave in order to obtain a reward or to avoid a punishment. Andy characterizes external regulation. As the process of internalization proceeds, interjected regulation involves behaving in order to satisfy internal contingencies. You know, we have high standards. And when we meet those high standards, we feel pride. We feel self-esteem. We feel self-aggrandizement. But of course, interjection is a double-edged sword. When we live up to those high standards, we feel great. And when we don't live up to those high standards, how do we feel? Bad. In particular, we feel guilty and ashamed. Barb characterizes interjected regulation. Third, identified regulation involves understanding the value of a behavior in one's own life. With identified regulation, there's a personal value, there's a personal relevance to the behavior and we behave because of it. Chris characterizes identified regulation. And finally, with integrated regulation, not only do we understand the value of the behavior, but that behavior is synthesized with other important aspects of the self. Consider, for example, someone who wants to quit smoking. It's a hard behavior to kick, of course. But imagine that I want to quit smoking and I understand the health benefits of doing so. And I say, you know what? I want to live to see my grandchildren grow up, get married. I can't do that if I may, I'm not as likely to do that in this behavior. So not only do I understand the health benefits, but the health benefits are linked to other important values that I have. That is integrated regulation. And Dom characterizes integrated regulation. So within self-determination theory, there are two broad categories of motivation. Autonomous motivation means to endorse one's behavior fully, to step outside of what you are doing, to reflect upon what you are doing, and to endorse your behavior fully. With autonomous motivation, there are accompanying experiences of choice and volition. Your behavior is self-determined. Your behavior is self-directed. And there are three types of motivation that are characterized as autonomous. Intrinsic motivation, integrated regulation, and identified regulation. In contrast, with controlled motivation, we feel coerced into behavior by external or internal forces. There's a feeling of pressure to think, to feel, or to behave according to someone else's agenda. As a result, there are accompanying experiences of pressure and obligation. The idea is that the behavior is something that you should do. The behavior is something that you must do. The behavior is something that you ought to do. The behavior is something that you have to do. And there are two types of controlled motivation, external regulation and interjected regulation. And finally, you may be asking, what's the big deal about autonomy? Does autonomous motivation really matter? And indeed, research within self-determination theory over the last 45 years has asked that question. And what the research has shown is that across a variety of important life domains, autonomous motivation is associated with higher task persistence and higher task performance. When students are autonomous, they persist longer in their educational pursuits, and they perform better at those pursuits. Autonomy is also associated with higher task interest, enjoyment, and creativity. Those all seem to be important outcomes in the classroom. 
Autonomous motivation is associated with higher levels of relationship quality, higher levels of psychological health, and higher levels of physical health. And so to review briefly, self-determination theory focuses on the type of motivation rather than on the amount of motivation. Intrinsic motivation is supported by choice and positive feedback and is undermined by external contingencies and negative feedback. Extrinsic motivation can be internalized to varying degrees and as a result can be experienced as more or less autonomous. And finally, autonomous relative to controlled motivation is associated with positive outcomes across a variety of life domains. I've been speaking for a while nonstop. It's sort of what I do, and it's fine. But I want to pause and see if there are any questions, any comments, any reflections that you all may be having now. Sorry, you've got double duty, I guess. Voy a, voy a hablarte en español y te hacen la traducción para que sea más correcto en los términos. Wait a minute. Are you going to speak in Spanish or in English? In Spanish. I feel like I'm in the Nuremberg trials. <laughs> Cuando... Cuando estamos hablando permanentemente de estos eh, procesos o estos tipos de motivación hacia los estudiantes, hay algo que a mí siempre me ha causado como una cierta inquietud y es cómo se relacionan también esos tipos de motivación respecto a la madurez del individuo. Porque no es lo mismo eh, los esquemas de desarrollo de motivación para estudiantes que tenemos en un primer semestre que los que tenemos en un posgrado, o los que, pues, o sea, hay, hay, difer hay ciertas diferencias, yeah. incluso a veces por la misma formación social que han tenido. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, the question essentially is, do students at different ages experience motivation in different ways? Okay. Yes, of course. And what we find, there's not a whole lot of great research on this, but what we find in general is that with age, students experience more autonomous motivation. That being said, autonomy, and in particular intrinsic motivation, is there from birth. I mean, if you look at what children do through a lens of self-determination theory, everything that they do is intrinsic motivation. It's all exploration, it's all curiosity. And children's intrinsic motivation has been shown to be undermined as early as one year old. Ex extremely early <laughs> in a child's life. And so the question is not, should we treat students differently at different ages? The question is really, how can we respect students' basic psychological needs at all ages? Because if these needs really are universal, which we have strong evidence for, then they need to be supported across the lifespan. They may be supported in different ways, but nonetheless, it's important that they be supported across the lifespan. And we'll talk about some general strategies later for how to support basic psychological needs. Okay, others? Um. Well, I have a question, and it's regarding about the grades on the school and the college. I mean, uh, how to avoid the thing that the grades uh, stop the internalization process? Maybe with the innovation in educational psychology or in, in educational yeah. environments, maybe it will stop it, but the system itself asks for the teachers to... Yeah. Of course. To maybe to label of course. a student with a grade. Of course. So. Of course. Grades, I mean, we'd love to believe that they're going away, but they're not. Um, grades have been around for a long time, and they're going to be around for a long time. The question is not, can we get done with grades? The question is, how can we use grades in a more informational way? 
And what I try to do with my students is I acknowledge on the first day of class, I hate grades. But I like my job, and if I didn't give you grades, I'd lose my job. I'm going to give you grades. I have no other choice. But what I would like to do is to make the grades as non-salient as possible. There will be no pop quizzes. There will be no trick questions. I'll write questions in a variety of ways, true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank, essays, etc., with the understanding that different students learn and perform well with different types of questions. And when the exams come back, I encourage students, and it's not always easy, but I encourage students to look at the exams as pieces of information, not as high stakes. The idea is, if you did well, that tells you something. If you did not so well, that tells you something too. It doesn't tell you you should work harder. It tells you, here's where you're doing well, here's where you have some areas for improvement, and let's make sense of that together if you're willing, or at the very least, go and make sense of it for yourself. And so I try to remove the high stakes from the exam, and I try to use the exam much more, and, and the grade, much more as a piece of information rather than as a high stakes contest. Other, other questions before we continue? OK. Got some more fuel. I'm ready to go. I love talking about human motivation. And I love talking about human motivation in the domain of education. And the reason for that is education is all around us. I mean, it's hard to think of any human being on the face of the planet who has not or will not be exposed to some formal education in his or her life. And when you have a domain as broad as education, people speculate about how we're doing. They philosophize. That's probably not a word, but they philosophize <laughs> about how we're doing in education. And what I'd like to share with you now are two perspectives that on education that have been advanced by people who have had immense impact on our modern, modern culture. The first comes from a very smart man. He gave us general relativity and sort of changed the way in which we understand the world around us. Einstein, speaking on education, said the following. It's nothing short of a miracle that the modern methods of instruction have not yet entirely strangled the holy curiosity of inquiry. For this delicate little plant, aside from stimulation, stands mainly in need of freedom. Without this, it goes to rack and ruin without fail. He goes on to say, it's a very grave mistake to think that the enjoyment of seeing and searching can be promoted by means of coercion and a sense of duty. I mean, in many ways, he's the first self-determination theorist. What he's saying is, it's a miracle that we haven't entirely undermined intrinsic motivation in the classroom. And what students need, aside from stimulation, is autonomy. Autonomy is at the core of freedom. They are synonymous in many ways. Without freedom, without autonomy, the student goes to rack and ruin without fail. They lose their intrinsic motivation, they lose their autonomous motivation, and they simply behave to get the grade. And it's a very grave mistake to think that we can promote the holy curiosity of inquiry by appealing to coercion and duty. Yet how often do we see that? as the modus operandi in our classrooms. That's one perspective on education. I tend to value his opinion, but you may not. I want to share another perspective on uh, education. This comes from another person who has had immense impact on our culture. He helped to end the Cold War. He was a great star in many Western films. And he was the 40th president of the United States. Unfortunately, he was not a very smart man with regard to motivation in the classroom. Reagan said the following, 
the educational system is experiencing serious difficulties because we are not enforcing adequate discipline in our schools. Really, all of the problems that I grew up in in the educational system is a result of my misbehavior. And if the teacher just kicks me into submission, I'll learn a lot more? Really? And subsequently, and after a slight gain in average SAT scores, which, by the way, predict nothing, <laughs> I am pleased to be able to tell you that we have made serious gains in our educational endeavor. Seems a bit short-sighted to me. But let's consider the facts. Let's consider the evidence. Research within self-determination theory has shown that teachers' orientation toward autonomy support is associated with higher levels of intrinsic motivation, perceived competence, and self-esteem. When teachers support their students' autonomy rather than seek to control their behavior, their students flourish. Higher intrinsic motivation, higher competence, higher self-esteem. Also, learning material in an autonomy supportive way is associated with intrinsic motivation and conceptual understanding. We learn at a conceptual, deeper level when we learn in a context that supports our autonomy. Finally, autonomy support is not about laissez-faire. It's not about permissiveness or do anything. Sometimes we set limits. Oftentimes we set limits on our children's behavior. My daughter is not permitted to run into the street. That's a limit. But how those limits are set matters. When limits are set in a controlling way, this undermines intrinsic motivation and creativity. When limits are set in an autonomy supportive way, intrinsic motivation and creativity are maintained and enhanced. What about across academic levels? Among elementary students, autonomous motivation is associated with higher levels of achievement and adjustment. Children do better and they feel better to the extent that they're autonomous. Among high school students, autonomy is associated with higher levels of well-being and lower levels of ill-being. In college, Autonomy is associated with higher levels of competence, interest, and enjoyment, and lower levels of anxiety. And then finally, among medical students, autonomous motivation is associated with higher levels of autonomy supportiveness by standardized patients. And so across academic levels, autonomous motivation matters to the promotion of positive outcomes. But what, 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 what about across the world? In Germany, students' interest in three academic subjects co-vary with their perceptions of teachers' autonomy support. Teacher, students perceive classes to be more interesting to the extent that they perceive their teachers as more autonomy supportive. In South Korea, feelings of autonomy and competence are associated with higher levels of intrinsic motivation. In Canada, Intrinsic motivation is associated with higher levels of well-being, independent of performance. And then finally, in Great Britain, autonomy support is associated with higher levels of intrinsic motivation, which in turn is associated with more effort and persistence in physical education. And so autonomy support matters. Autonomous motivation matters across the academic educational spectrum. And so this leads us to an important and final set of questions. How can we create need-supportive educational climates? Oh, do you have a question? I'm sorry. Maybe some authors uh, talk about Latin American people, the studies of uh, motivations uh, of students, the motivation in Latin America. Talk about that, uh, what uh, teachers or different uh, free, what? Do you have uh, studies about that? Anna? Motivation. What, is it, what exactly is the question? No, just asking about if there are studies in Latin America. Ah. Are there any studies in Latin America yeah. in regards to the autonomous Yeah, okay. 
I can think of one from Brazil that was part of a larger study on autonomy support, I think from parents. I have a sample from Peru, which I'll present in a minute. And other than that, I don't have a whole lot of data other than what Ana Munoz and I are doing currently. Um, we have some data that are sort of hot off the presses, where we show that across three academic levels, in elementary students, in high school students, and in college students, when students perceive more autonomy support from their teachers, they experience more autonomous motivation, more perceived competence, more engagement, which ultimately has a positive effect on their grade, on their self-esteem, and on their friendship quality. And so these dynamics seem to be real, including uh, in, in Latin America and in South America. But the data, is, the research is really in its infancy um, in South America, but we're working to change that. Um, well, regarding that question, well, the main goal of this uh, project maybe is to develop more research about uh, uh, motivating teachers and climate in the educational environments. But um, I've seen um, studies in Peru and well, actually, my dissertation, I made it here in Colombia, but it was with uh, the advisor of Chantal de Beck. Mm -hmm. And I've seen studies in Argentina about this topic. So yeah. maybe I can show her. I can show you. Yeah. So it's growing. It's, it's burgeoning. But it's still in its infancy. But I think the important point is that the dynamics hold, regardless of the country. I want to turn now to a consideration of need support of education climates. And I want you to think about all the teachers that you've had in your, sorry, in your educational experiences. And from among that long list of teachers, which one stands out to you as your best teacher? Do you have someone in mind? Or a group of people? Fine, OK. With that person in mind, I want you to ask yourself two questions. First. How does he or she relate to you? And second, what types of opportunities does he or she afford you? Just, just, just in the classroom. How does the teacher allow you to behave, allow you to think, allow you to feel in the classroom? Just take less than two seconds. Now return to that long list of teachers. And which one stands out to you as your worst teacher? I mean, the one who more or less looked like this. And with that person in mind, ask yourself, how does he or she relate to you? And what types of opportunities does he or she afford you? I have a quiz. I never give quizzes except for when I'm lecturing in other countries. But I have a quiz. How many of you would agree with this set of statements, either in part or in full? My best teacher does the following in the classroom most of the time. Tries to see things from my perspective, encourages me to do my best, strives to create a warm, caring, interpersonal environment. How many of you would agree with this set of statements, either in part or in full? Everyone, probably. Fine. How many of you would agree with this set of statements, either in part or in full? My worst teacher does the following in the classroom most of the time. Tries to see things from my perspective, encourages me to do my best, strives to create a warm, caring, interpersonal environment. How many of you would agree with this set of statements? Two. OK. Typically, what we see is 100% agreement with the best teacher and very low agreement with the worst teacher. 
And why is it that there's such consistency in these results? Think about these statements. Tries to see things from my perspective. That sounds a lot like support for autonomy. Encourages me to do my best. That sounds a lot like support for competence. Strives to create a warm, caring, interpersonal environment. That sounds a lot like support for relatedness. And so it seems quite naturally that your best teacher is a need supportive teacher. Your worst teacher is a need thwarting teacher. And indeed, optimal strategies for motivating students is of interest to most, if not all, educators. And so recently we've been doing a study where we asked undergraduate students to write narratives about three individuals. The person who taught the last course in their major, their most motivating teacher, and their most demotivating teacher. And here are two sample narratives with regard to the motivating teacher. The course was mostly discussion, and the teacher made the class interesting. He let students choose their writing topics and welcome new ideas. He encouraged my disagreement with his opinions so that I could express my ideas. I learned a lot about this course, and it was not about the grade. It was about exploring new ideas and perspectives. Consider now a narrative about a demotivating teacher. This teacher, apparently, did not feel the need to connect with or to help her students. She gave constant praise to the students who understood the complex material, while she verbally abused the students who did not, telling us that we did not deserve to be in her course because of one bad grade. She repeatedly refused to give me extra help, so basically, it was all up to me. So we coded those narratives for content related to autonomy support, competence support, and relatedness support. And what we found first is that relative to the teacher of the last course in the major and relative to the demotivating teacher, students wrote about their most motivating teacher as one who supports their autonomy, who supports their competence, and who supports their relatedness. And so quite naturally, just like you did, students distinguish their best teacher from their worst teacher as one who supports their basic psychological needs. But you may be saying now, come on, students love grades. Grades are a great motivational tool. Grades should be motivating, right? And so we coded those narratives also for grade focus and grade emphasis. And what we found in line with our hypotheses, but contrary to a typical naive view, is that relative to the last course in the major and relative to the motivating teacher, students wrote about their most demotivating teacher as one who emphasized grades in the classroom. And even though the teachers, the demotivating teachers, emphasized grades, the students reported their worst grades in the demotivating classroom. So all the hard work that the teachers were doing trying to emphasize grades had a paradoxical undermining effect. It's nice that you can do this with 123 American undergraduates, you may be saying. But self-determination theory is a universal theory, and so we should see this around the world. I agree. And so how about 19 countries? We've been collecting data from 19 countries around the world asking students to write narratives in their native tongue, and we've been coding those narratives in the student's native tongue for support for autonomy, competence, and relatedness, and grade focus. And unequivocally, across all the nations that we've sampled, we found strong support for hypothesis one, that motivating teachers are teachers who support autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Also, in three quarters of the countries, which is a good percentage, we found strong support for hypothesis two, that demotivating teachers are ones who focus strongly 
on grades, who emphasize grades more than learning in the classroom. I want to point out that these three no's, they're all no effects. We never found in any country that motivating teachers strongly emphasized grades. They were just null effects. And so I want to conclude with a consideration of how we can put all of this into practice. It's critical for educators to provide support for their students' autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Support for basic psychological needs begins with an authority figure, or a peer, if you're in relationships, but it begins with an authority figure assuming the first person perspective of another individual to really try to understand what life is like in your mind, through your eyes. And once we work our way into the first person perspective of, of another person, we begin to support autonomy. The idea is we elicit and we acknowledge our students' thoughts, feelings, and perspectives. What do you think about this material? How do you feel about it? What views, what beliefs, what attitudes do you have with regard to it? How do you make sense of this material in your own life? Second, we encourage self-initiation and choice. The idea here is we have goals. Learning, for example. And there are many different ways to achieve that goal. How I learn is probably not the same as how you, my student, learn. Far be it for me to say you must learn in the same way that I learn. So try out things for yourself. Explore. Self-initiate. Be choiceful. Now, of course, you may encounter setbacks, you may encounter shortcomings, you may fail, but I will be there to help boost you up if and when you experience those setbacks. Third, at times we set limits on our students' behavior. At times we make requests of our students. And it makes all the difference if we can provide clear, meaningful rationales when limits are set and when requests are made of our students. Students will only internalize the value of what we are asking them to do if they understand the value of what we are asking them to do. And then finally, we minimize use of controlling language. Controlling language is all around us. Should, must, ought, have to. It spews forth from our mouth as peers, as parents, as romantic partners, as bosses, and indeed as teachers. Think about how you feel when someone says you should work harder. You feel like a pawn. You feel like someone else is pulling the strings on my life. Let's, let's refrain from that type of language as much as possible in the classroom. What about support for competence? Support for competence begins with a real belief that the student can succeed. There will be so-called difficult students. But as a need supportive teacher, I want to believe that somewhere inside of you, there's success that's just waiting to blossom, that's just waiting to come forth. Our job as educators is to always be positive that our students can succeed. Second, we give optimal challenges. Optimal challenges are just a little beyond our, our students' current skills and capacities. They're not too difficult. They're not too easy. They're just a bit beyond. And when we have optimal challenges, they stretch us. They expand us psychologically. We grow through optimal challenges. And third, give accurate, effectance-relevant feedback. Here's how you're doing. Here's what you may consider doing to maintain your high performance. Here's what you may consider doing to improve your performance. Active, effectance-relevant feedback. 
And then third, with support for relatedness, we develop warm, empathic, non-judgmental relationships. With me, for me, the real key here is non-judgmental. We have, and our students have, so many people in our lives who are more than willing to pass judgment on them. Let's, as teachers, not be one more person who is judgmental toward our students. Let's regard, let, regard them positively, love and cherish and prize them, regardless of their thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and performance. It is possible for people to learn to be need supportive. There was a study done several decades ago in the workplace where the intervention team came into a workplace and they trained managers to be need supportive. They spent 13 days training managers, which is not a lot of time. And what they found is that for those managers who received training in need supportive principles from before the intervention to after the intervention, they showed a significant increase in how much they were perceived as need supportive. More importantly, there was a ripple effect to the employees. The employees who had managers who were need supportive, they reported higher levels of trust and higher levels of job satisfaction in their jobs. And so to conclude, the quality of students' motivation matters. Autonomous relative to controlled motivation is associated with higher levels of conceptual understanding and personal development. And teachers can facilitate autonomous motivation in the classroom by providing support for their students' autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And with that, and for your time, for your attention, for your very thoughtful and provocative questions and comments, I say thank you. I'm happy to answer questions if they come up. Mm, well, first of all, I'm not sure if you know about this, about the Project 250, or this project. Um, it's a project of innovation in educational environments applied here at the FED University. So actually I come here to work and to assess, to make research into the, how is, what's the impact of the innovation into the motivation of students. So, well, I've been working with scales and questionnaires such as learning climate questionnaire, basic, basic psychological needs, and self-regulation scale. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can advise me or tell me what else can I use in order to assess. I know that you use narratives in, in cross-cultural research. Yeah. Um, it all depends upon your research question. It's very difficult for me to say what questionnaires you should be using without knowing your research question. But I think you begin with a very good set of questionnaires when you say things like need support, relative autonomy, perceived comments, need satisfaction, because those really form the motivational core of our line of research. You might assess student experience, performance, connectedness with the classroom, um, but beyond that, it, it really depends upon your research question. I wonder if you have any answer about uh, an issue that is happening right now here as we have a lot of millennials and millennials are, are very difficult to captivate, to engage, to enroll. So if you have any advice with this kind of students that are more and more coming in the university. Yeah. 
So the question has to do with millennials and what to do with millennials who are very entitled, who are very uh, distracted, um, and who have a whole bunch of stuff coming at them concurrently and makes it very difficult to be focused. As with anyone, because millennials are no different psychologically than you, or I don't even know if I'm a millennial, I doubt it, I hope not. But in any event, we're all the same people. The question is, can we develop curricula, can we develop lesson plans that spark interest and engagement in our students, that speak to the issues that are a concern of our students? We're much more likely to, ca to captivate our students, millennials or whoever, if we can speak to them through our teaching. I acknowledge that it's difficult, and I would probably encourage you to acknowledge that with your students as well. Hey guys, I understand, I mean you may not believe it, but I understand what's going on for you. I, I see it, I get it. Let's see how we can make the best use of our time together, given all the distractions, given all the other concerns that are a part of your life. And so it's working with them rather than against them. And especially with Projecto 50 where there's a strong focus on innovation, I think millennials are all about innovation. And if you can develop curricula that bring innovation to bear in the classroom, more power to you. Mm -hmm. Buenas tardes. Eh, quisiera saber si existe alguna curva de tiempo en el que al aplicar esto que usted nos enseña eh, la autonomía y la motivación intrínseca empieza a surgir y la segunda pregunta es qué metodología utilizó para codificar las narrativas gracias okay. So with regard to the narratives, we ask students to write essays. And then uh, we trained research assistants to see those essays in highly reliable, consistent ways. To see autonomy in the statements that are made. To see competence and relatedness in the statements that are made. And so there was an awful lot of training that went into it. Now with regard to the curve that you spoke about, is the question really if I, if I become need support of how long does it take for this to, okay. I don't know. What I do know is this. It's not a magic bullet. If you go and do this tomorrow and you see no positive effects, I'm not surprised. And I would encourage you not to be surprised as well. I think, I think what the mindset that I would have, and I sort of have this with my daughter, who's very, 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 independent in her thinking. She's four um, and she gives her teachers a run for their money because they're teacher-centric. She's Annika-centric. <laughs> She's child-centric. Um, trust in organismic development. Trust that we have a natural trajectory toward full functioning, toward organismic wellness, and that our job is not to shape development in a certain way, our job is to create conditions by providing need support in which optimal development can occur. It's the task of a human being to develop. And we become biologically equipped to move toward growth and health. What we as socializers do, if we're good socializers, is we provide support for autonomy, competence, and relatedness and allow those natural trajectories to move. It takes time, of course. Gracias y adios.